Okay, well, um, this is a photo finish for sure. I just got done with it about two and a half seconds ago. I hope that's not my mic making that noise. No, I think we're fine. Um, and I'm going to talk about anticipating the learner needs of learners in virtual worlds. What uh, precipitated uh, this, and you'll see as we go along, is the SL MOOC. Uh, we had a particularly successful Second Life MOOC this past April, as Nellie was probably telling you. But there are also things that we started to think about that we could do better. And many of the speakers that we had talked a lot about how they were bringing learners into virtual worlds and what were some of the problems and some of the possible possibilities. So the, the, the pros and the cons of doing that. Um, if you could see me, which you can't, my hands are going because I'm a little bit Italian. So we're going to see if we can move this forward. There we are. Okay, so the talk is going to be uh, divided up into these sections, orientations to virtual worlds, and the virtual world in this case is, is Second Life, identity and skills for virtual world learning, communicating course details in world and ex elsewhere, providing course materials, mixed use of active and passive learning, and the fruits of our success. <laughs> Thanks to the students, my recommendations for the future, and some links. I've been suffering from a cold, as Nellie knows, so I've got a cup of tea, and, and uh, uh, I might turn my mic off occasionally if I'm starting to cough. So these are uh, some illustrations that will become uh, obvious as we go along. <laughs> I, As you can tell, if you have gotten into the Second Life MOOC playlist at all on Nellie Deutsch's YouTube channel, I'm taking a um, partial... Uh, um, Partially, the recommendations of John Orlando, who was one of our speakers, to show more than um, to do all this other stuff here. So I'm going to, um, to avoid bullet points at all costs, I couldn't do that completely, but I, I tried. <laughs> so orientation to virtual worlds, there's a lot of things that impact on how students are going to feel when they are told that the course that you're teaching has a component that's going to take place in virtual worlds. If it's World of Warcraft or Lord of, or Lord of the Rings Online or whatever it might be, Second Life, of course, they're going to have an idea in their heads or they're going to get on to a search engine like Google and try and find out as much as they can about um, that virtual world that you want them to go to. Now the virtual world itself, and there's Second Life to the left there, they'll tell you only the good stuff. They don't tell you any of the difficulties. They don't tell you about how, um, how fast or strong or consistent your computer needs to be or your internet access or any of the rest of that stuff. They tell you about the wonderful stuff that goes on. And they're not lying. There's an enormous amount of really wonderful things that happen inside of virtual worlds. But there are also ups and downs. If you go out to YouTube, you find a whole variety. For instance, What Second Life Means to Me by Strawberry Singh is one of a series of videos that people made in honor of a recent anniversary of Second Life talking about what their work is in Second Life, what they do. Strawberry Singh is a photographer in Second Life, and she's also a, a blogger on Second Life. And there were lots of these great videos. One was done by um, uh, Alice uh, Krieger, who's known as Gentle Heron in Second Life, and gave a talk for our students in the Second Life MOOC in April. So they talk about their work, they talk about what they're interested, they talk about what's happened to them over the many years that they have been in Second Life, who they've met, and what are the wide and, and wonderful things about it. Down in the right-hand corner on that second line of illustrations, you see the SL MOOC April 30th um, uh, video, and it shows the group of students from that course talking to each other and taking a tour of an incredible build with Hindu uh, temples and all kinds of wonderful meditation spaces, very richly built area, and we all took a tour there. So that's one of those great experiences that you can have as a person who's inside of Second Life and that you can provide for your students. On the other hand, many folks have think, seen things like Man versus Second Life, which is basically a... Um, it's a fun sort of parody on some of the the pitfalls that might uh, get in your way, some of the obstacles that might get in your way 
in Second Life. And when you're certainly a newcomer, you're not quite sure what you're doing and how to handle things. And you may feel like you're free falling through space, which is one of the things you can do without <laughs> without having any problems. Um, so there's those kinds of videos. And then when you're even going through the process of, of getting your avatars, you see screens of different types of avatars. And there's the classic ones and the new ones. And then you get to this wild kind of collection of werewolves and all kinds of uh, dragons and vampires and heavens knows what. And that can be kind of daunting. It's kind of orient them to what you want them to know about it. You want to assuage their fears. You want to tell them, you know, they're going to be with you. They're going to be in the classroom. Um, they're going to be getting tips from people who know how to stay safe in Second Life. They're going to find out how to have a good, positive experience. And you have to provide that as the teacher. chapter in a book that was published by the American Library Association in 2009, which was sort of at the beginning of the hype for Second Life, um, and actually is the year that I got into Second Life. And the book was by uh, Joe Sanchez called um, Second Life Ideas, Challenges, and Innovations. And he pulled together a lot of information from other teachers and from his own work about how to think about bringing students into Second Life and making libraries and creating good experiences. And he identified a number of barriers. One obviously is technical difficulties. That can be anything from a slow internet connection to an unstable internet connection or having a five or six or seven year old computer that really can't handle the new viewer. So there are certain kinds of difficulties that you might need to solve for some of your students. And if you have a number of students in your class that are not going to be able to get into Second Life at home and you don't, you need a computer lab space, if that's not available, then you need to find out how you can set up perhaps a buddy system between um, uh, several of your students where you have a group of students going to the house of someone who's got a stable environment. So the techno technological difficulties need to be resolved for your students. And if you can't resolve them, you need to give them another way to enjoy the course, learn from the course, and be able to successfully complete the course. And that's something that Nellie very rightly put in place for the SL MOOC courses from 2014 up through 2016. There was always another learning management system on which the students could come into contact with the class material. There's always an additional time um, that has to be set aside for the learning curve. And when you have an eight week course or a 12 week course or even a semester or year long course, the students may find that very frustrating that unlike their other courses, they need to set aside time for the learning curve. If they're gonna be able to get in world, solve their technological uh, um, problems, they're going to have to do tutorials, learn how to get dressed, you know, all this kind of stuff. So there is an additional time component there. Now, one of our speakers, uh, Dr. Becky Adams from the University of New Mexico, talked about how they resolved that by having the learning curve be part of the course itself. So the first few weeks of the course, and Meredith Barkham too, also from um, University of Texas at El Pas Paso mentioned that, the learning curve was built into the um, course, uh, built into the course development process and the initial course objectives for the first few weeks. So you were bringing them in, you were helping them do what they needed to do, you were giving them abilities and skills and so on that would help them in in world to do things in world. And as Nellie's saying, because Moodle doesn't require a good internet connection and can be ac accessed offline as well as um, it, uh, um, in la you know in a live situation, you have uh, if you're using another learn learning uh, management system like Moodle, then you've got that covered in a sense. But you still want to have those people who are going to try to be in world 
have the time that they need to get used to navigating and building skills and so on. And we'll talk about that a little bit more later. Then you've got these world expectations, which is essentially what I was talking about on that previous slide, which is they've heard from their friends that this is a terrible place and that it's only full of casinos and brothels and God knows what else and it's just not safe and so on. Or you've heard, uh, they've read in the newspaper that Second Life is dead and so maybe it won't even be there for the length of the class and all these kinds of things. So there are, there are world expectations that can be positive and negative that will impact on how you introduce your students to the virtual world that you're using. Then there's interface issues, and these are things like lag. If you get into Second Life, um, you may be very laggy. And actually, this is my depiction of a laggy situation where you're trying to get through a wall and you kind of get stuck because your computer is a little bit stuck. Or you might be trying to walk slowly and suddenly you're walking through everything and your avatar won't stop. So there are problems with um, uh, how long it takes between the signal coming into your computer and resing on your computer and all these different kinds of technical things that make it a little bit difficult for you to be able to walk around. Sloodle is um, a facility that allows you to connect a Moodle framework with Second Life. And one of our students this year is an expert in that and has already uh, said, Cami Rembrandt has already said that she'll help us out next year trying to establish this. I'm afraid I, I didn't do such a good job of trying to learn how to do that. So we're hoping next year we'll have that connection between the two, the two worlds. And it's kind of neat when you do because then you can see the avatars on the Moodle installation and you can click through from Moodle to um, the teaching areas. Another one of those interface issues could be just your skill set. And this is me doing something that everybody does at the beginning when you go to get new clothes and you wear the box as opposed to open the box, you can end up in a situation where it's a little silly and you have to get rid of the box. And then um, because it's time consuming to learn all these skills, People can, especially if uh, the assignments are a little bit taxing, you know, they take some skills, they take some time, uh, the students can, can experience, experience frustration if they're not getting the help that they need. So this is me covered in boxes um, this morning. So these are some of the things that can make life difficult. And as a teacher, what you want to do is kind of anticipate everything that may slow down somebody's process. I remember... Many years ago, I was on a committee at the University of Virginia, and they were building a replica of the art, um, uh, the art gallery of the, the art museum of the university um, in Second Life. And they asked me how long I thought it would take for people to achieve proficiency. And I said three weeks. And they looked at me like, oh, my God, we're trying to bring in hundreds of people over you know, the space of a week. That's not going to work. And then they said, well, how long do you think it would take to teach a person to walk forward and look up? And I said, five minutes. So um, it depends on what you're going to have your students do in that virtual world framework and what you need at what step. So you can also ladder out um, uh, or ladder up the skills that you teach them according to what you need them to do and then have to build in some fun for sure. That's what everybody always says. So some of the positives for the new students is that they get to customize their their avatar, and that's very important to everybody. Um, it's one of the very first things that people want to learn how to do. They don't want to stick with the clunky old system avatar. They want to change their clothes. They want to get a new look. Sometimes they want to make the um, avatar look like themselves. Sometimes they want to experience being a paper bag or a dragon or a walking house or a Minecraft character or a pile of blocks or whatever it is, a, a, a furry or a small, a little small uh, um, creature, whatever, they might want to really go through um, a period of kind of playing around with their look because they can do that. So uh, avatar customization with some, some help from the faculty and from mentors maybe, that's a really wonderful learning curve. It gives a student a sense of mastery over themselves and over their pres presence and their representation in the virtual world. And that instills a little bit more confidence, I would think. 
Students love creativity. They love being able to see what other people have done that's creative. They love to be able to try and create things themselves. And they begin to understand that some virtual worlds like Second Life are user created, which means everything you see around you is from someone who came in world and started with the same blocks and shapes that you did, that you do, and built up something wonderful. So that's important and both customization and creativity lead to these feelings of accomplishment and that gives you more confidence in how you're handling the course as well and more motivation to keep on going. So um, these are some of the positives. Now these were from a study that had been done in 2008-2009 so Second Life was in its relatively early days at that point. But I think these hold true, and you'll see that in the next presentation I'm going to um, talk to you about. The final presentation of the SL MOOC 2016 this year was delivered by Scott Onstad, who's a retired professor from Florida Gulf Coast University. In fact, he retired on the day that he gave the talk to us. Um, and it was called Using Virtual World Simulators, meaning Second Life, in Social Work Course Assignments. So it was a two-year project that they did. And they wanted to um, uh, give students a, because these were people who were going to grow up to be social workers or, you know, graduate to become social, social workers. They wanted to give people a wider cultural reach, whether it was religion or ethnicities or languages or whatever it might be, so that they could have experiences in the virtual world that would inform their ability to do social work experiences that would be difficult to get in real life without traveling huge distances or finding your local um, Hindu association or meeting someone that could take you to visit a mosque and so on. So that's kind of what was going on. And this is Scott's, um, Scott's avatar, Ewan Bonham, and the lecture started out in the cultural community hub on Whole Brain Island, which is um, part of uh, the Inspiration Island Sims. And i am got a couple of slides so you can see his presentation here. This is a great place to go because it gives you a lot of introductions to other destinations inside of Second Life. And instead of just having a wall board that you click and you go through to the new place, it has lots of information about the communities that are there and what is the purpose of the place, how it was built and so on. Anyhow, so in the study that he and his colleagues did, they wanted to demonstrate the use of Second Life in a structured and self-directed platform for enhancing cultural com competency. You can see that on the slide. And it was a mixed design two-year study. So it was both qualitative in terms of getting interviews and asking open-ended questions and quantitative in terms of seeing the assessment and retention and so on. And what they were really looking at was comparing a traditional versus a Second Life specific course design for this cultural um, competency kind of objective. And they wanted to look at engagement and desire to learn in the two various areas. And their student surveys showed significant improvement in student in involvement and appreciation of Second Life as an arena to discover cultural resources. But what you're gonna see is something that's important to the point that I'm making now, which is the difference between how you introduce your students and how they feel about the, the, the experience itself. So it happened over two years. The micro, uh, the learning objective was this expansion of cultural competency. The micro uh, course design consideration was uh, Second Life Navigation and Avatar Identification Identity. And the macro was the recognition and exploration of a range of cultural community resources in Second Life. And there's this subtext there, which is now we're enriching these students who will go out to be social workers to be more mindful of other ethnicities and cultures and so on in their work. Now, this is very interesting. In year one, they were just going to focus on the Second Life parts of this that are relevant to, to um, teaching in, in a virtual world. They gave them a video by Linden Labs about how to walk around, how to fly, and so on. And if the student asked, then they would provide one-to-one -one mentoring. They used some search engines and a list of landmarks to help them find and explore communities on their own. And then they had a community uh, profile listed owner or word of mouth kind of thing. So they would go and have to find somebody who could tell them about the place they were exploring. 
and get to talk to that person and figure out what it was about that area. And it wasn't didn't have to happen in the second one. And then they had a focus group at the end, which was their open-ended conversation about how did this work out? How, how good did it work for you? In year two, they switched the way that they were orienting their students to Second Life. They had the videos made by the professor. So all the tutorials were being done by people that they were going to see over the, over the duration of the course. They did three self-guided tours pre, um, were presented and you give them a note card and it has landmarks on it and it tells them where to go. And you could give them one-to-one um, -one teaching if they needed it. And they recruited a number of mentors to be available to the students. I actually went through the mentor training, but then didn't have the time to join the group. They did a video, again, by the one of the professors on avatar identity, how to change clothes, where to find new clothes, and all this kind of stuff. And simple art creation workshops and tours where the class was together and they were learning how to make a uh, box uh, glow and spin and um, change shapes and that kind of thing. It was really a fun activity. And then they took them on guided tours. Then they sent them out to explore communities using the cultural hub as their whole home base. And they asked each of these folks to go and see key informants. Now these were people that they went out ahead of time and built a working relationship with. So in this case, instead of just sending the student out to find their informant, they set up a relationship with the formant, informant to begin with. And then people would come back to the community's cultural hub and give a presentation about their experience to the other students. So there were two aspects there. They weren't cold calling, as they say in, Amer in American English. They weren't just walking in on somebody they've met before and saying, gee, I want to talk to you about what you're doing on the sim. They had a, someone who was prepared for them, that was waiting for them, that knew why they were there and would have a, would have a good conversation. So the instructors prepared the ground for those conversations. And then there was that extra piece of being able to come back and say, look, guys, look what I found, which is a wonderful academic, uh, active learning kind of thing to do. And then at the end, again, they had the open-ended conversation. Now look at the difference here. I'm only showing you the qualitative results, and these are responses to the survey question. So you, all for a lot of negative stuff was happening here. The initial impressions of interest from exposure to some spiritual practice, so they, no, eh, it's okay, it was kind of nice, and we like that. But things were difficult and awkward to access. They didn't talk about their avatars. They never mentioned anything about diversity or what they found. And they really didn't want to do this again. They really did not want to have anything to do with an online virtual course after this experience. So that was not everybody, but it was some folks in the class. They did notice that many of these places they explored had beautiful art and backgrounds. They didn't talk a lot about the key informant. They didn't talk about the usefulness of the information they gathered for being assessed in the course. They were interested in community ambience and architecture, but that was about it. They didn't comment on how they integrated many sources of knowledge. And they, they did positively say, well, we did see some new practices in other people's spiritual traditions. In 2014, where they had this much more pre-thought out, pre-planned, and um, interactive and more personal kind of inter um, environment for the students to engage in the Second Life activities, there's a very different set of tone here. And certainly there was interest and desire to attend more services and to learn about other spiritual practices as well. They found Second Life to be easy to access. Help and assistance was always available to them. They figured out how to make simple clothes changes and they figured out what their prefer preferences were, how they could set up their identity. And as you go down here, there's lots of more positive comments, openness to including Second Life and traditional traditional courses, beautiful art, and uh, interest in the sources of values, heightened sensitivity, awareness of range of family values, and how members relate to each other. They understand that they understood the purpose of the cultural assessment in their own class. So they were a little bit more connected to how the class was put together and what it was that they could get out of it. And then they were also noticing personal biases and acceptance of other persons 
who may become clients at some point. And that helped them bring this knowledge into their internships and their practicums and so on for being social workers. So there was a big difference from plunking them down in the world with Linden Laboratory or the group that owned Second Line with Linden Laboratory tutorials. And you know, if you ask, you could get a little bit of help, but don't, you know, otherwise we're not going to set up a structure to setting up a structure for people to be successful in the course. A very big difference. And he's got quantitative data that, that uh, double checks that, or d hits that quite well. So what we tried to do in the Second Life MOOC, and this is the third one that we've done, so it's evolved on, on all parts. So Nelly is, manages the Moodle and is in World, and I manage the Second Life stuff and mess around in the Moodle, and Doris uh, does both to make sure the social presence is going on the Facebook page and so on. So we all have kind of divided up what we're doing, and we've had different, Nellie and I have had different collaborators over the years. We started out with Doris and Malero in um, uh, 2014, and then it was Kip Bone in 2015, and now it's the three of us again, and we've had some interest from one of the students and uh, from uh, another individual about maybe joining the organization team. So as we go along, we have kind of morphed it uh, change the course according to what we're learning and what we're hearing from the students and finding ways to to get over those barriers. So this year one of the things we did was we added more uh, tutorials about um, uh, how to get into Second Life. This is actually the one that we made for 2014 and I didn't see a reason to change it because I went and I went and through that again with another alter avatar and it basically worked the same way. But I did go ahead and make a new video for getting free clothes and making outfits, not because I knew Scott's results, but because I had read in other places that it's important for the actual one of the actual teachers that they're going to be in contact with to be doing the tu these tutorials. So you're recognizing a person that you're going to be working with. Um, and that helps. And then I made a second one called Change Me, Changing Your Look because students were asking about it. You know, how do I make my avatar taller? How do I make her shorter? How do I make him more muscular? How do I make him, you know, where am I going to get a tattoo or a little bit of facial hair if I'm a nice meaty guy kind of thing? So I, I uh, being a, a girl in real life and a girl in Second Life, I, I managed the... Uh, I made a tutorial in which I told people how to change the physical aspect of their um, of their avatar. So we tried to do that, build in some tutorials that were more personal and that would cover the identity aspect to some extent. We also tried to do that with course skills. Again, this is one we made for for a previous year. This was the joining the group um, uh, core. Um, tutorial, joining the group tutorial. That's our little group joiner that's always in the building. Um, doesn't work any differently than it did in 2015. So we just put this up in the SL MOOC playlist. And this is a very important thing. And I give you the link for this at the end of the, co the conversation. And Nellie, if you could let me know where I am in time, because my screen is completely <laughs> wide here and I can't see my timer. Um, and then uh, I made a new tutorial that would tell people how to get information out of all of these wall boards. I'm going to talk about the wall boards later. And I didn't do that in 2015, and I certainly didn't do it in 2014. Oh, thanks, Nellie. Um, uh, because uh, partly in 2014, I wasn't involved in that part of the class. I was sort of a, um, handling some of the lectures and being a mentor and so on, but I didn't do the organizational work of the setting up the MOOC. Doris did that that year, and she did a wonderful job. She's the one who thought up the wallboard idea. Um, but I noticed that in some cases, the names of the, the, you know, we all got so busy that in some cases in 2015, the names of the um, uh, folders that you would get in your Second Life inventory didn't match the wallboard and all this kind of thing. And then there were other ways I thought maybe we could get give more information. And since we already had things from 2015, it was just a question of adding on in 2016. Like all this wonderful um, furniture came from Doris. So that was it, click everything. And then after a comment from one of the students, I did one on organizing your inventory because every time you clicked one of these cute little guys, they gave you a subdirectory in your inventory and it could get a little bit daunting. So again, 
I did um, some course tutorials for the course because of that idea of I'm somebody you're going to see. And also modeling uh, different looks too <laughs> because that's a lot of fun for guys and girls in Second Life is to play with how you look. I mean, why not? And then we uh, worked on building skills. And we did this in two ways. We had a, um, uh, I did two lectures, one on building skills and one on finding resources for teachers. And then there was an active in-world component, which was attended by a small number of people. The first time I did it, it was very, very informal. And the second time I did it, I built these in 2015. I built these display boards, put them in our play playground, and then the students could go through and um, work through all of the information and do all the little activities and I would be right there to help out so that's what I did. When we did the resourcing one I did again a lecture and um, followed up by a tour of various places in Second Life where, you're, where you could get um, more information about building skills and teaching skills and so on so we, I took a tour so there was this active part. Hey, Doris. Um, and I was a little worried about this. I was worried about doing a lecture and then an activity. More people came to the lecture than the activity, obviously, because there were many people in the Moodle part of it that couldn't come in world. And there were many people who were on a different time zone and were not going to be able to come in world when we were gathered and would have to deal with watching this and getting to this point. One thing that made me feel better about that is that several people, at least two people anyway, mentioned this uh, basic skills lecture and the resource uh, um, lecture as being useful because it had lots and lots and lots of um, uh, links and it gave them some ideas about what things were going to be like when they got in world and they could use it as a reference and so I felt better about that but as you'll see when we get down to the end I have some recommendations about how to do this part of it differently I think the tour was really useful I'm not sure that the workshop was as useful as it should have been or that we had enough workshops on those types of skills so then another thing you have to think about before you even get started is how to communicate the course details uh, we've had for a while the Second Life milk and our big maven for Second Life was Doris who made sure that everything was an event, that everybody was invited, that there were pictures from every activity, that when the videos went up people knew where they were and could get them. Um, she really made the Second Life MOOC a Facebook page a very vibrant and important part of the course. And, um, you know, Nellie and I would contribute occasionally, but we knew that Doris was building that and was keeping that going and keeping that sense of community going. And that was very important. Nellie was the one who started up the Google Docs. We had the presenters bios on the Google, Google Docs. Yeah, exactly. Exactly, Cheryl. And um, also the live sessions when they were going to take place, where they were supposed to be and so on also on Google and this was something that Nellie set up. She also set up informational and sign up sheets prior to the class starting for all of us who were presenters. And in her, um, this is a this is one of the slides from the bios and this is genius I think and I've mentioned this more than once but I wanted to mention it again. On every bi bio slide uh, that anybody would see and at the top of the Google Doc presentation list there was always this wonderful list of links that would take you everywhere you needed to go in the Second Life MOOC course and that was fantastic and again I dipped in and did my bio and I dipped in and signed up to do some lectures and pulled links out for the wall boards but if Nellie hadn't put this up and put this together the course would have been infinitely poorer in comment uh, content this was just as important as the Facebook page that Doris did and then this is the Moodle uh, for Teachers site where the Moodle learning management system took place and there were many, 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 many more students there than actually were able to come into, um, uh, come into Second Life. So these three things were very important. And then there were other things. Um, Doris did a wonderful uh, 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 presentation that went out onto another social media site. The three of us were uh, involved with the SL MOOC Twitter page. 
there was a lot of marketing going on. There were the YouTube channels and all marketing for that kind of stuff. So you're, there's lots of ways that you're going to be communicating your course details and you have to think carefully about what's going to work for you best. And I think definitely the learning management system was extremely important for those who could not come in world with us or could not be there because of time uh, constraints, um, even if they had the technology. And the Facebook page for building and retaining and promoting community, not only while the course is going on, but as the year rolls out in between, that was so important. And Nellie's so right, it's going to be better every year, year by year. So this is a picture of Dora sitting having some coffee and telling people how to get your coffee cup out of the 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 cushions and the because the cushions and the chairs over here try to get you to get your coffee cup and behind her are the wall boards and this was my my province back here these were announcing boards that would tell people about the upcoming experiences and this is another thing that Doris would do is create an event for each one of the activities and use the wall board as the illustration for the event so this is what a wall board would look like I tried to make them very um, uh, very uh, uh, she certainly does and it's a wonderful thing um, I tried to make these very consistent across the entire course so that you got the title of the, the activity, the day on which it would take place, the times, some of some if not all of the presenters, and then a little bit of information of what would happen if you clicked the board. Let me get my little thingy again. Now I'm going to show you what was in the wall board. <laughs> you have to hold on two seconds. I need another drink of tea. Doris do hers to begin with. And I also learned some things from some of the neighbors because one day something happened in the neighborhood and I came into Second Life and all these wall boards were in the air. <laughs> hundreds of meters away from the building and I had to put them back. So I learned how to make them locked in the building, which was something one of the neighbors told me. But basically, you're using the wall boards in Second Life to give information. Um, you can, you uh, may, um, thank you, thank you. I worked really hard on them and I was kind of getting behind the, behind uh, my time schedule at some points. Um, this, the wall, a wall board is something fairly common. If you go into a library or a learning center or even a store, you're going to be clicking on a wall board and it will give you information about what you want to buy or what you're trying to learn or whatever. So one of the first things I learned is every, every wall board has to be named for the presentation that it's telling you about because otherwise you get a folder in your inventory that doesn't have the correct name. So that was really important. I put the date in the descriptions. I'm not really sure where the description goes. Um, in general, I would click on show in search, and I'm not sure why I didn't on this one, but I would click on show in search. So if somebody searched um, uh, Second Life, they would find the this wall board, and that would give them information on how to get to it and, and how to come to the class. In the content area, I would put in the biography of the individual. I just copied and pasted the biographies from Nellie's um, presentation. I would put in any of the important uh, slurls that were needed, you know, landmarks to the headquarters and landmarks to where the event was going to take place. Towards the end of the course, I didn't put in the landmark to the um, uh, headquarters if we weren't going to be in the headquarters because it was confusing some people. Um, so I learned not to do that next year. And then I would put in the SL MOOC, re you know, the SL MOOC, description of the presentation and the presentation would also have those those landmarks written out as in terms of a slurl so an address an online address would be in there as well but I could also add in um, YouTube videos by uh, the person like Linda Rogers who's known as Kate Miranda in Second Life had done a what Second Life means to me YouTube video so the link was in the the, the uh, note card so you could give a lot of information out. And if you wanted to give them a tool set or a bunch of materials for a project or whatever, you could do that too. You could just fill up this whole content area. So that was one thing I wanted to do. 
And then when you clicked on these boards, like you clicked on, here's remediation, if you clicked on uh, Kate Miranda's talk about uh, learning literature in the massive online role-playing game, Lord of the Rings Online, um, uh, you clicked on it, you would get this little dialog box which would say keep or discard and Kate Miranda is going to give you a folder that's called SL MOOC 16 Remediation by Kate Miranda. So this is why it's really important to make sure your wallboard has the correct name because that's going to be the name of, this is going to be the name of the folder in the student's inventory and you want them to be able to find what they need to use and then you would keep on click on keep and it would go into your uh, inventory in Second Life. So all of these wall boards were all set up in this way with their own bios, their own uh, extra information, their own landmarks, and their own um, note card about the event. And this is what it looks like. So you would, it would give you this folder in your inventory and we would tell folks go to your inventory which is that little suitcase in Second Life and click on recent so you don't have to search for it elsewhere and then you would find these things. This is the little uh, script that gives them the folder and then the biography, the two landmarks that you could click on and get to the place and the note card. And here's the note card so you can see what the information was on, on this particular note card and here's her biography. So we could give quite a lot of information. These have been um, edited because the course is over now and we want people to know that this took place but you can you can go and see the YouTube video. Here it is here. You can go and visit the place where the YouTube video was made. You can visit the island. This is actually the question and answer YouTube that goes with the presentation YouTube. You can go sign up for the game and play it yourself. If you got in there before April 30th, you could join the course. Um, this is the SL MOOC playlist and then this tells you how to go to that board and join the group so you don't miss anything about next year's version. And then this is the biography that Linda Rogers um, gave us for the course. So you, so when the cor uh, course was over, I went back and went through every one. I have to double check, but I'm pretty sure that I went through every one and edited them so that they were now in past tense. And one of the reasons why I did that was if you're going to do a course that's going to live in the same space for many years, now what I can do next year is move all of this stuff up to the second floor, move all of the 2015 and 2014 stuff up to the uh, third floor, and rebuild the first floor for 2017. So that, um, if, if so long as Linda Labs is still around, which since they're making millions and millions of dollars every year, we hope that's, <laughs> that's going to be the case, then this kind of information will be there and you'll be able to go back and see what happened last year as well as take advantage of what's happening this year. So there's both passive and active learning involved in courses like this. And activities obviously are active and guided and unguided tours are active. Sitting in front of a lecture, which is the, was the format of many of the um, events that we had, is not quite as active, but it's more active than reading a book or sitting in a lecture hall with 450 people and listening to some little tiny person at the very front of the auditorium drone on. Um, lots of studies are out there that show that retention in lectures is really not very good, but if you get a lecture inside of a second a virtual world, you're actually getting it, you're keeping it in your mind a bit more. And then shorter lectures, of course, are better and so on. And this particular le lecture given by Valerie Hill of uh, you, uh, Bradley University's Community Virtual Library was followed by a tour of not only the library but an installation that they had put together for a medieval role play game. So that was really useful. And this is one of our students who po posted Maria Vincenza uh, Helio, who, um, or Gilio, who posted to Second Life um, after a challenge we gave for people to go and explore and take pictures of themselves when they explored. So she was out on Vertlantis and put it up in the Facebook page. This is a guy, this was touring alone essentially, and that's a good thing to do, but it's always a lot more fun to tour in groups. This was the tour that took place as part of Meredith Abarca's and Janet Hill's um, presentation for us on the Afro Latino Food Waste Museum. And so we were all there after a brief lecture from Meredith and Janet, we were all there to uh, take a look at what was going on in, in the library itself. 
And then down here is the video of this experience because this is the interior of the Food Waste Museum and this is both active and passive. It's passive for all of us who have the ability to tour this now, but the students of the original uh, Afro-Latino Food Waste course at the University of Texas in El Paso, they built this. They built all of this stuff. They designed it, they planned it, they got the building skills, they put it together all to represent the history of of the melding of cultures in in um, Texas and the different how different uh, especially the Latin Americans and the and Afro Americans how they brought their food into the Texas environment how it became part of what's going on in the southwest of the United States and it's a wonderful place it shows you all kinds of uh, interesting things as well as uh, concepts and it was all built by the students of the course so they learned enormous amounts of skills and it's an educational uh, these are all teachers it was a teacher training course they learned how to think about the visual presentation of information they learned how to put that into practice and give a, an experience like the experience we had um, of coming through it, walking through, and learning about these the history of these two cultures coming together and then impacting on Southwestern culture in the U.S., in food, food culture in, in the U.S. As, as a whole. So these kinds of things can be extremely enriching because uh, lots of studies are showing that experience is experience. When you're in a virtual world, you are experiencing something, and there's a great deal of identity connection between you on the outside looking at the screen and you on the inside wandering around and what you're learning and feeling and connecting comes in and stays in just as it would in real life and in some cases a little bit better. So the fruits of the success for all of us obviously was getting a certain number of first giving a good experience to everybody that was in the course in so far as that was possible to encourage and be hope, helpful and um, hopeful and give people like Alex great memories um, of areas in the in the course. Um, so we were trying to create an environment that would make them as excited about online learning as we are and I hope as excited about Second Life as a learning environment as we are. But we were also trying to help folks get through it in a more formal way, deal with the materials, put through their reflection and get a certificate. Um, and and the fruits of success were both the friendships that were made. I now have two new tenants um, in my, uh, one new tenant in my neighborhood who's a member of the course and one of our presenters has um, come, become a member of our community in Second Life as well and we're working on things that we want to see um, to beef up the education in our, um, in that area. One of the the presenters uh, who presented last year and the year before is my Spanish teacher and oops it's asking me to make it longer. Nellie are you going to do that or do you want me to? Well I'll do it and we'll just give it lots. I'm sorry. Um, yeah no I don't want to stop scare sharing my screen. I'm going back to my screen now. <laughs> just a sec. Okay. Um, a Eugenia Calderon, I'm talking about, she's my teacher, and it's great to see her come to the course activities and events that she wasn't giving a talk in and bring her students as well. This is our final dance, and this is Zinnia Zauber, who was one of our presenters, and I think this is a Eugenia here and some of the students. So the fruits of success are also the individuals who um, go through the course completely and get to the end of the uh, course and feel that they really want to do a reflection. All of the people who put up pictures in the Facebook page, who were hanging around the Second Life Mook building, who used the, who I'm still seeing in the sandbox and so on. So we had a dance <laughs> to congratulate, our, congratulate ourselves on getting through everything and having such a good time. And this is a picture from the dance and you can see this is Beth Ghost Raven here, I think. And and I think that's Eugenia and Beck in there somewhere is Doris and that's Sidia Zaber and that's me. Um, and at, a, at one point we had a few more people than that. So this is from uh, one of our, one of the pictures that went up on uh, this Facebook page. And then this is a certificate from Monica Vocally, uh, and there were a number of people who um, uh, managed to get certificates. And this is the translation of what she said. Quite a challenge, but I did it. 
So I'm, I'm, I'm sure there's this sense of accomplishment, not only for Nellie and Doris and I, but for almost everybody that went through, I hope for everybody, but uh, who went through the course, um, it was really a, a labor intensive, but a great um, experience. So having done that, as usual, the three of us have been talking about what we want to do next year. One of um, uh, Doris's ideas, and I think this is really important, is that we need to do what um, Scott Anstead did, and that is to recruit mentors, especially previous students if possible, who can be available to help people with building skills and shopping and creating identity and any other thing that might be necessary to get through it really collaborate with a team of teachers if you anticipate what you're going to be doing in a virtual world is going to be a large yay alex um a large uh class or a very complex class it's really not something you can do on your own alone without having many many months of of time to get things going and it was very important that um th that's all right alex nelly has volunteered me lots of times too and it's enriched my life <laughs> i have to say um, so it's really important to get a, a, a group of people that you can divide the work up with. You just find your theme for the year, you have your objective in your head, you talk that over, and then you divide up the work in such a way that a lot of attention can be paid to the class while it's going on without, without breaking the, the, you know, sending us all to the hospital from exhaustion. Because remember, especially courses like this, um, Nellie and Doris and I are all volunteering our time. And, and as well as, as the presenters are. So that's um, something that you have to manage. If you're getting paid to do it and you have a group of assistants, that's um, fantastic, but you always still have to think ahead. How many people am I really gonna need to pull this off and to divide up the work in such a way that um, life is easier for, for me <laughs> and for the students, life is enriched for the students. You want to plan your marketing, your informational materials, and what technology is appropriate. This is one of Nellie's and, and Doris's, too, have always said. And one, the thing that I learned from them is you develop your pedagogical or andragogical goal. You've got that in your head pretty solidly. And then you figure out which technologies are important to use for that. You just, you just don't go out there and do whatever is the latest thing because you and then kind of smush your course, you know, squeeze it in five different directions to get it to fit this latest trend in technology, you need to really only use the technologies that manage, um, that will help you reach your goals and will not overwhelm your students and will be so appropriate. Then you want to make sure you have more in-world help with identity and basic skills. And I've been thinking that maybe next year we should have a standing make and take kind of uh, basic skills tutorial that goes on all the time. Um, that's really important. Hi, Doris. Um, it, because I think the, the lesson from, from uh, you and Bonham's talk and from other people that we heard talk during this one was that you really have to make that road into the virtual world as unbumpy as possible, as good an experience as possible. So you want to provide mentors and experiences with opportunities as well to meet creators and teachers and interact with each other one-on-one, -on -one, whether it's in world or on the Facebook page or wherever it might be in the Moodle. You want to provide more challenges, I believe, um, to post to the Facebook page or the learning management system, not only because that builds community, as Doris was doing so well, and not only because um, involvement engages, as Nellie says, you, you really get more and more invested in getting through it and getting the most out of it as you're working towards that goal and as you're seeing the people around you work towards that goal. But I think it's really important for the students to be proud of their accomplishments and to see that all of us, all of the mentors, all of the instructors, whoever is around in that administrative capacity, that facilitator capacity, is proud of them too. Um, that we see progress and we really are appreciative of what they're doing. Yeah, the reflections have been terrific. And then you want to listen to the students' feedback. What was tough for them? When did they feel lonely? And I think maybe next year we'll we'll do a, some kind of an exit um, course survey or something to get a little bit more information that way. But we were certainly getting talked to, and people were talking about their experiences, and you could tell from their questions what was bothering them, what they needed to learn. 
You could tell from um, their reactions to things when you got it right and they were really feeling comfortable and so on. So those are my recommendations for next year. And this gives you, I hope is giving you a kind of an idea of what's involved in anticipating what the learners need. And the badges are very important. Yeah, we all need badges. I don't care if we get to be 110, we need badges. Um, it's, it, you have to have an, you have to have collaborators. I think if it's going to be large or complex and you have to think about what's going on. And it, it's easy as somebody who's been in um, Second Life for, I've been in Second Life for seven years and Nellie, I think a year longer than me and Doris, I've forgotten when you first came in, but um, it's easy to forget what it was like to be a newcomer and newcomers need um, support and they need friendliness and they need sometimes to be left alone just to figure out how things work for themselves that but they need to know that there's somebody there that they can talk to and also that most educators and so on um uh are really and librarians and so on are really wonderful folks and you can just talk to them you can ask them questions um i said that in our resources that you can ask anybody and they if they haven't got it they know somebody who has it so um, that's really important, but so just, just to give you an idea what's in, in involved. So that's me. And I, uh, just wanted to give you the links. Uh, this is Moodle for teachers. This is Nellie's wonderful site that has a lot of different courses going, including Moodle MOOC 8. Um, and there's always something wonderful to learn there. And she has many services that she can provide for people. She's my, uh, website hoster and my Moodle MOOC hoster. And, um, I'm, uh, very grateful to her for doing that for me. And I'm, she's the person who taught me how to use Moodle. Uh, join the Facebook group for sure, because there's going to be a lot of things coming up all year long. Um, you can visit the SL MOOC headquarters. It'll be, com nothing is coming down off those walls until we start pushing things up on the next floor and building for the new course. So that's uh, there and will be available to you. You can come visit that course, the SL MOOC course on Moodle for Teachers, as well as Nellie says. Follow us on the SL MOOC um, Twitter feed on Twitter. And we also have an SL MOOC 16 um, as well. So you can follow that. And then this is the playlist. This is really important for this year. Now I still have some film, some raw film that I have put together from last year and the year before. And, but some of it is out there and we're going to try and get all that kind of stuff coordinated, coordinated so that it's easy to go and find things that we had last year and the year before. Um, and so that's also important. And if you're interested in getting in touch with me, that's my email. My uh, website is called theasire.org. Uh, it gives you more information about um, the research interests of my husband and I and our uh, learning center, which is actually right next door to the SL MOOC headquarters building. The SL MOOC headquarters building is called Integrating Technology. Um, and you can find that on uh, the YouTube search, uh, not YouTube search, on uh, Second Life search. Um, but we're right next door to each other. The neighborhood is open to newcomers. There's the freebie store. There's changing rooms. There's the playground with the sign post up so you can learn how to take pictures and do all kinds of stuff. I think I'm going to, uh, well, no, I'll stay here. Um, so there's all kinds of things um, that are available in that neighborhood. And now we've got some some new stuff as well. So um, I'm going to shut off sharing my screen and come back to the classroom. And if you have any questions, don't hesitate.